Ambassador Kristen Silverberg, she served as the ambassador to the European Union in 2008 and 2009, and as Assistant Secretary of State for International, Org International Affairs. Prior to her time at the State Department, she held a number of senior positions at the White House, including Deputy Assistant to the President and Advisor to the Chief of Staff. Welcome, Kristen. Thank you. And perfect timing. Our third speaker is, an amb is Ambassador Keith Harper. Ambassador Harper served as the U.S. Permanent Representative to the United Nations Human Rights Council in Geneva. He's a partner at the law firm Kilpatrick Townsend in Stockton and has worked as a chair of their Native American practice. And Ambassador Harper is a member of the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma. Welcome, Ambassador Harper. So, Danny, I'd like to start with you. Uh, it seems like the assault on Israel and international organizations is prevalent and widespread and longstanding. From where you sit and from your experience, what's the reason for that? And from an Israeli perspective, how do we continue to fight for what is right in the United Nations? Well, first off, Michael, thank you very much. It's an honor to be here and share the platform with this distinguished guest. Uh, and to be here with APAC. I say APAC keeps uh, America strong and Israel safe. So thank you all for doing that. Now, the short answer to your question, uh, uh, Michael, is that uh, the design here is very simple, to bring about the destruction of the Jewish state by different means. Fortunately, uh, our enemies cannot take us on militarily. They tried economic boycotts, and that didn't work. If we fast forward, Israel's today is probably among the strongest economies in the world. And uh, not just that we live off our intellectual property and um, cutting edge uh, high tech uh, industry and innovation, we, against all odds and predictions, found all these huge uh, reserves of uh, natural gas in our economic waters in the Mediterranean. So when they cannot use military means or economic means, they go for political means. And by political means, I mean delegitimization, BDS, and international organizations is a pillar in this strategy. And uh, you mentioned all this uh, myriad of uh, negative uh, resolutions in, in the UN. 85% 85, 85 of all resolutions in the United Nations are condemning Israel. And only 15, the rest of the world, talking about Iran, North Korea, uh, Pakistan, Afghanistan, you name it. So you see the, 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 the real discrimination here. Uh, we're talking about uh, Geneva, the Council of uh, Human Rights, and in every organization. And there is what we call this uh, um, transactionality. So for instance, there is a, uh, a conference in Nairobi, UNEP, you know, on habitat on, or uh, climate change. Then the Palestinian uh, representative would say, Yes, but I want to mention that Israel, the occupier, the illegitimate country, uh, is doing the worst thing in um, polluting the land and all kinds of things. Talking about uh, children's safety, the same thing. And again, this is uh, a political war, and unfortunately, uh, we have not realized it was a political war until very recently, the last uh, Few, few years, so the Palestinians really have a, a real edge. So we are now playing catch up, and to level the playing fields is going to take a lot of efforts. Unfortunately, it's not just the government of, of Israel, you know, they, they are not the most effective, and I can say it as part of, as I was part of it, we will need here a whole global community. And here I'm talking about Jewish communities. Christian communities around the world, I think they should stand up and not sit on the sidelines. Keith, I'd like to turn you, to you next. Um, you, as I mentioned in your bio, uh, you served as the ambassador to the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva. Uh, it's traditionally uh, one of the worst offenders against Israel. It's a challenging place to work. Um, what did you see while you were there, and why do you believe that Israel uh, is uh, so often singled out at the Human Rights Council? 
Well, first of all, thank you for having me, and it's so nice to be with uh, uh, distinguished colleagues uh, here. I think uh, I don't disagree with the assessment that's already been made, um, but I would add that um, a couple of points. Uh, one, from a U.S. perspective, I don't think we can underestimate that this is also a attempt to attack the United States as well, that there is a realization that it is in the U.S. interests to protect from biased treatment one of our key friends and allies. But it's very difficult to attack the United States directly as a P5 member of the Security Council, as the world superpower. So oftentimes uh, they, 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 they attack our other, our other interests, Israel being one of them. The other thing I think, and you see this um, very profoundly uh, on the ground, and uh, there are those who are uh, let's say, uh, uh, foes of Israel, um, but uh, within, for example, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, who don't see eye to eye on virtually any issue. And so this issue is oftentimes the single unifying issue uh, for that entity. And so we also see that, um, and that's why it's so vociferously uh, attacked and, and pursued. And so I, I think there's a, a myriad of reasons why this uh, exists is biased, but the fact is, is it does. I think the interesting question for us uh, from a United States uh, perspective um, is how do we address that over time? How do we chip away at the bias over time? And um, you know, I think different folks can have different thoughts on it, but from my vantage point, it takes diplomatic work, it takes the United States leadership working with our allies, and I think if you see to the extent that we have used those efforts, they have paid off dividends. Um, and so it's in my, by, my, by my way of thinking, we have to continue those efforts. At the end of the day, the end goal should be the, that, that Israel is treated like all other states among the community of nations. Uh, we're far from that goal, but I think that with smart strategic thinking and appropriate diplomacy, we can get there. Thank you. Kristen, uh, I'd like to turn to you now. It's, um, during your time as the uh, Assistant Secretary of State for International Organizations, um, you oversaw the U.S. contribution to the United Nations, uh, obviously a critically important role. Uh, what can you tell us about the role that the U.S. plays across all of these international organizations uh, and how it might push back against some of this anti-Israel bias we're discussing? I think the U.S. has a critical role in this issue. I was really grateful that President Bush was willing to put U.S. leverage and influence to bear on these issues. I always felt like I had a lot of leeway to do that. And there were a few different things we did. Um, we always lobbied for votes. Um, in the General Assembly, that's a um, next impossible task. As, you know, as Danny would remember, we'd get votes where there would be 13 member states on our side, um, but we would work really hard to make sure that we at least move countries into the abstention column, that we at least didn't get them supporting nasty resolutions. Um, we are very comfortable using our veto in the Security Council. You know, when you're in, when you're in my old role as Assistant Secretary and you tell your colleagues you're going to veto a resolution in the Security Council, the whole building goes crazy. They tell you the world's going to end. Um, and the fact is it doesn't. It's fine. And so we issued veto instructions and, um, and blocked those things in the Council. You can shine a spotlight on on bad votes by member states, and I really applaud what Ambassador Haley has done in this regard. She's been very vocal. The U.S. has a big megaphone. Yeah. The U.S. has a big megaphone, and she's been comfortable using it, and I think that's great. And then finally, the U.S. can use its considerable leverage through its um, both willingness to participate in organizations and also its fu funding that the U.S. has to be prepared to put those things on the table um, in the extreme cases to say, Look, when things get, we're going to try to make this work, we're going to work hard, but if we can't, if this organization is not salvageable, then we're going to withhold our participation and our funding. Danny, back to you. Um, one of the platforms in the international community that is often most critical of Israel is UNESCO. We've seen many resolutions uh, over the last several years um, denying uh, the Jewish connection to Israel and to Jerusalem. How does Israel respond to this? How does it correct uh, some of these falsehoods, and what's the strategic uh, sort of vision that Israel might have in responding to things that, resolutions like this that are passed at UNESCO that are so blatantly false and ridiculous, but yet they receive overwhelming support from the international community? Well, Michael, the strategy is basically to discredit UNESCO, its uh, current uh, form. 
We may go even further about pulling out funds. I know that the United States have done it a couple of times. I think they're considering doing it again. Uh, I think what is very frustrating is not that the Palestinians and their collaborators are bringing all these out outrageous resolutions which really rewrite history and deny our history. The, the amazing thing is that many countries, decent countries, even European countries, are voting with the Palestinians. So basically, they are voting against their own heritage, the Judeo-Christian uh, heritage and presence, whether it's in Jerusalem or Judea and Samaria, is undeniable and you can find it in every inch of the land. You know, you just scratch a little bit and you find 4,000 years of, of rich Jewish culture. So uh, it's really frustrating that they really cave in to the, uh, to the, uh, the, the Palestinian or uh, Arab uh, uh, pressure here, they use the automatic majority. As Kristen know, we are uh, one vote, the US has one vote, a few other countries, but basically when you stand, you know, on, on the other side, you have 22 Arab countries, part of 57 Muslim countries, part of almost 120 what used to be non-aligned, uh, which very much de either depend on, on Arab oil or depend on Arab markets, things like that, or just an inertia. So out of 193 member states, uh, you know, before any resolution, they already have in their pocket 120. So what can you do? Uh, the idea, as I said, is, is just to, to, to discredit it and, um, and to form what we call a moral majority. You know, countries that they would vote with the United States. It's very, very hard because politics, unfortunately, and, and interests are, are playing or, or looming uh, very uh, large. But what we know from history is that we cannot sit idle and that we could, should respond in every way, in every media and means we can. Michael, uh, less than a century ago, uh, the uh, Nazi regime, Hitler and Goebbels, started the most nefarious uh, incitement in the annals of the world. And they talked about the Jewish communities in Europe in terms of vermins and rats and, uh, you know, poisoning. And the Jewish communities, you know, they thought it was so outrageous that nobody would believe it. So they didn't respond. And then the Nazis called for the extermination of the Jews. And the Jews still think, wow, we are part of Europe, you know, we brought Jure Spinoza to, to Europe and, Alfred I and uh, Albert Einstein and Sigmund Freud and Mendelssohn and others. Nobody will believe it and let's lay low and this, uh, we will not dignify any response. How do you respond to somebody who calls you a vermin? And things will come and go. Well, we know that uh, a few years later, you know, we know the results in the crematorium and in the death camps. The same thing and the same method is being used today by the Palestinians. And I'm not talking about Hamas. Hamas is openly says that they you know, are for the destruction and they are working on the destruction of the State of Israel, aided by Hezbollah, Iran, and, and other extreme uh, and radical uh, Islamic organizations. I'm talking about the Palestinian Authority. Supposedly, they are our partner for peace. But they are the ones who really uh, spread the most uh, outrageous lies and incitement, and it's not just in the international community, it's also reflected in their curriculum, in their media, and, and here our response is, and our, I think our very important lesson from history is we should respond every lie, we should respond in any way we can, and it's not just for us to do, it's for everyone to do, any decent, and today we have the social media, so anyone can be Ambassador for the Truth. Thank you. Uh, Keith, one of the, uh, um, the recurring complaints we hear about the Human Rights Council is the existence of Agenda Item 7, the infamous Item 7, which uh, it's a permanent agenda item dedicated to criticizing Israel. Uh, at the same time, you have many uh, serial, serial human rights abusers like Saudi Arabia, Venezuela, and others who serve on the Human Rights Council. Um, some may say that this institution is just so badly flawed, it's broken, it can't be fixed. What's your response? Well, I start from the proposition that, you know, in the aftermath of the Second World War, the United Nations was created with three pillars. 
One was peace and security, one was human rights, and one was development. And so a United Nations without a body that addresses human rights would be troubling indeed because it's so essential for what we call the international rule-based order, how countries treat uh, the individuals. Um, so I, I think we have to do everything we can to try to make the Human Rights Council something that works. I will not disagree in any way with the notion that it is a flawed institution. The question is, how do we address those flaws? So a couple of things. With respect to the bias against Israel and uh, item seven being the sort of clear manifestation of that bias, the only country in the world with a standalone agenda item, uh, every other country has to, you know, it falls within the full gambit of the, uh, of the council's agenda uh, and is dealt with, and is, uh, item seven is dealt with every single session. And unlike North Korea, for example, that may be dealt with once a year. Uh, so it, it, is, it is a problem. The question is how do we address that problem? And my firm belief, and it's not a belief based on conjecture, it's a belief based on record, is that it takes active United States engagement working with our partners, working with our uh, uh, Israeli colleagues to chip away at this bias over time. Let me give you one statistic that I think exemplifies why I think this is a better approach. In the first three and a half years of the Human Rights Council, the United States made a decision not to participate and not to have a standalone ambassador uh, there. During that period, that is when item seven came into creation. Uh, I am of the belief that we are there at the beginning that we may have been able to stop that. Now, uh, others uh, point to the fact that that hasn't been taken away in, 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 in future uh, reviews of the council session. My response to that is it's always easier within the UN system to stop something from, be, from the beginning than to try to change it later. That's just the nature of the, of the beast. More importantly still, in that three and a half years, there were six special sessions on Israel. Think about that. Special sessions is when the situation is so grave so incredibly stark from a human rights perspective that you can't wait for a regular session, you have to have an emergency session. Out of the 12 sessions during that period, six were on Israel. Uh, and, and then we look at when we did have active US engagement with an ambassador in place, a seven year period after that, there was one special session. So six in three and a half years or one in seven years. The difference is when the United States is at the table, others have to take us seriously but it takes a lot of hard work chipping away at this over time. Another example is this. Israel was the only uh, country in the world that was not in a regional, a regional grouping. And that's really important because that excludes them from all kinds of things within the UN system if you're not in a regional grouping. Uh, with work from the United States, working with our colleagues uh, in, in, in Europe, uh, and throughout the Western Europe and other governments uh, group, we were able to have, um, uh, and a lot of hard work from Isra Israeli diplomats as well, included for the first time in the WIA group. And so, I, this is not easy, these are not easy things. These things always take longer than we'd like, but the, but the fact of the matter is, is that if you look at the record with U.S. active engagement and without U.S. active engagement, the far better results are with U.S. active engagement. Michael, can I hop in on, on this? Keith and I have had this conversation <laughs> so many times, so he won't, he won't be surprised at all by my uh, disagreement. But we took the decision not to vote against the creation of the Human Rights Council and not to participate when I was an assistant secretary, in part because it was very clear to us at that point, you know, the writing was on the wall. Um, the people who drafted the resolution creating the council had rejected every U.S. proposal that would ensure the so kind of legitimacy of the council and that the members of it would have a genuine commitment to human rights. They were much more concerned about kind of the regional distribution and parceling out than they were about the credibility and would this be a council that actually kind of made a real difference in terms of promoting human rights. So, so we opposed it. And, and Keith is right. I think he has a really important point that U.S. participation can have some benefits. You can run some resolutions you couldn't run otherwise. You can make some resolutions marginally better. You might be able to stop some special sessions. But to me, the cost of those things is just too high because you're putting U.S. legitimacy, the U.S. imprimatur on some really bad and biased decisions. You know, the... Keith brought up this item seven, which as he said, was originally adopted um, when the US was out of the council. 
although the Canadians were in the council and objected and they adopted it in the dark of night and prevented the Canadians from calling for a vote. And my guess is the same thing would have happened to us. Um, but when it was readopted five years later, the US, during the Obama administration, the US accepted it. The US joined consensus on that. And that wasn't because the Obama administration likes item seven. They totally agreed with us on, on how inappropriate that was. It was because the trade-offs were too hard. And to me, that was so much worse because now our fingerprints were on it. That it wasn't just that it happened over our strenuous objection, it happened with our concurrence. And so to me, you know, my recommendation to my friends who are in the Trump administration is they should make a run at getting rid of item seven. They should make a, re a genuine effort towards Human Rights Council reform. But if they can't get those things done, then they have to leave the council. Um, and we have to find another way to, to advance our important commitment to human rights. Uh, Kristen, just as a follow-up to that, um, speaking of the, uh, the Trump administration, um, not long ago, uh, Ambassador Haley uh, brought up the issue of voting records at, at the UN. Um, you served as ambassador to the, uh, to the EU. Uh, I'm sure you had a lot of uh, interesting conversations with your interlocutors there and with other international organizations. Uh, what steps do you think can be taken in, in the international arena to change some of these voting records? Um, and what should the US be doing um, to try to influence that? Well, I, you know, I think we have a lazy habit in D.C. sometimes of talking about blaming things on the U.N. broadly. But the U.N., you know, it's 193 countries. It's something like 45 different organizations. And so if you talk about the U.N., nobody knows who's actually accountable. It's a way of sort of um, avoiding accountability for anyone. And I really appreciate how Ambassador Haley has said, look, we're going to draw attention to the member states who are taking these votes. We're going to keep track of that. Um, the State Department says a, sends a report to Congress every year with the voting records of different states, including their voting records on anti-Israel resolutions. And I think it's really important to bring visibility to that. You know, you can bring them up in your, um, in your Hill visits tomorrow. But I think, it's, I think that's an essential thing. Um, you know, Danny already mentioned this, but when the really bad actors at the UN vote on an anti-Israel resolution, it sort of just reaffirms what you already thought about that government, those governments. It's not a big surprise. But it is really upsetting when other members of the Western European group, which is the group uh, that Israel participates in, votes for them. When there was a UNGA resolution recently criticizing the U.S. decision to move the embassy, um, some, some of our allies, you know, Canada and Australia abstained, but the United Kingdom, our close partner, voted for it. Um, and I think, it's, I think it's really essential that the U.S. Mention, you know, make it an issue in our bilateral relationship with those countries that we're paying attention to these and that this is a priority for us. I'm going to ask one more question, then I'm going to turn it over to the audience. If you have a question uh, for anybody on our panel, uh, there's, a, there's a mic uh, in the middle aisle. Just uh, please uh, um, you know, can form a line, and then uh, we're happy to ask, uh, have you ask your question. Um, Danny, I, I want to follow up a little bit on what Kristen said and, and broaden it a, a, just a bit um, from your perspective. Uh, traditionally, uh, many of the countries that vote against Israel at the United Nations and other international bodies are from Africa, from Asia, from, um, from other uh, areas of the former non-aligned movement. Uh, Israel uh, and Prime Minister Netanyahu has uh, seemingly made some significant progress um, traveling to China, Japan, Africa several times the last several years. Um, and I'm curious, do you believe that, that, um, that some of those uh, budding relationships, commercial relationships, uh, strategic relationships, are going to result in some uh, change in votes at the United Nations and other international organizations? Well, Michael, most countries uh, differentiate or distinguish between the multilateral uh, activities and diplomacy as the UN and the international organizations and the bilateral. Bilateral, Israel has um, great relations and relationships with most countries based on uh, uh, military and strategic interests or economic, technological, you just name it. And those countries which are very much a, a friendly country to us, uh, look at the UN as something which is less important, and they say, oh, don't pay attention to how we vote. You know, we have to vote because of our pressure or this and that, but we are with you, we understand it. And for many years, we went along with that. Until we realized, you know, that 
these international organizations and the resolutions, anti-Israeli, this mass of uh, in, uh, international uh, resolutions against Israel, is basically the foundation and the cornerstone of BDS. This is what people read about. This is what children study about. And they say, well, the UN supposedly is a neutral organization. UN is good, so Israel is bad. And I think our challenge is to show, no, the UN, the way the UN is composed now, is bad. And I fully agree with Kristen. It's, it, it is time to have accountability. It's time that these countries will understand that voting and, and this, this political fight also matters, and it's also, at the end of the day, it's also existential for the State of Israel. Thank you. Okay, uh, so just a couple of ground rules for the questions. If you could, please uh, limit uh, your question to a question and not a statement, if you, if you may. Uh, and also, if you uh, could give your name and where you're from, uh, I'm sure our, our panelists would uh, love to know. So please, sir, go ahead. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Chinedu. I'm an international student from Nigeria. I go to school in California. And... Uh, the ambassador makes very fantastic points. And so my question is really simple. How do we young Africans uh, who like Israel and share um, the idea of Israel um, legitimacy, how do we get into politics and guarantee we do not just strengthen the relationship, but we show up and show out for Israel at the UN? Thank you. That's a wonderful question. I, I think that the best, the most effective way to see and understand the real Israel is to come and visit. I think anyone who visits Israel, for them, it, it's a it's, right, it's transformative experience. You know, we have launched, I mean, the Jewish people has launched for the last, I think, 20 years, uh, what is called birthright, where every uh, Jewish kid can, has the right to visit and it has been a f with phenomenal success. I believe that there are some uh, attempts now, more than attempts, to do some birthright for Christians, for what we call the Zionist Christians, or Christians that support Israel. I know that for uh, the government of Nigeria, your country, uh, during the, um, uh, the presidency of uh, Jonathan Goodluck, yeah. uh, they started a, a stipend where Every Christian that wanted to come to Israel for a pilgrimage received a, actually a, a subsidy of $1,000 to come. I think this is the best way that we can uh, change uh, ideas. And the other way is, you know, it's, it's very hard to bring everyone to Israel. I think social media is also very, very important. Today, with social media, you can reach everyone. You don't have to go to the campuses necessarily, although it's important enough, but you can reach those students or, or young people around the world on their iPads, on all their iPhones, on the keyboard. And if I may plug one thing here, the truth about Israel, this is exactly what we're doing. So if you go to the website, thetruthaboutisrael.org.il, and you see all the information, and you just share it with likes, the, the idea is to, again, level the playing fields for Israel in social media, which is so important. And here I have a very, um, a, 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 a very, very quantifiable objective, not just right there in the ether. And my objective is that anyone who would Google in the near future Palestine or Israel or Jerusalem or anything will come to our website, or at least also to our websites, and not only to the, the radical anti-Israeli websites. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, if, if you could ask your question and then maybe take a seat and allow the next person behind you to, uh, uh, to ask after you. Thank you. Go ahead, ma'am. Uh, Melody Malakon from New York. I guess I'm just curious how, in private conversations with you, diplomats from other countries justify criticizing and condemning Israel for things that, that other countries do or do much worse. And if it has to do with demography, like if it has to do with growing Arab minorities in these countries, um, how, how do we cope with that? Thank you. Keith, you wanna? Sure. Um, 
yes, I think in private conversations there is a different story to be told than when you are uh, in front of the cameras within the Human Rights Council, the General Assembly, the Security Council. Um, and I think that it's different for different countries depending on where they are in the world. Uh, for co countries within the EU, for example, I think oftentimes their, their, their uh, explanation is sort of the, the price of doing business otherwise. Um, that uh, these resolutions are going to come f forward and uh, the EU in particular is a funny entity because their principal goal is to be united and so what happens there is everything becomes lowest common denominator. In other countries I think it's a, a lot of it is muscle memory. I think Danny was pointing out how, how uh, I think both the US and Israel um, sort of let these things happen for too long um, and uh, uh, what it did create is sort of muscle memories within a lot of foreign ministries in the, develop, the developing world. Um, and I think our approach now is to be very uh, affirmative in our, in, our, in our fight, in our chipping away at this bias. And so I think it really depends on which country you're, you're asking for. But even the countries that seem the most hostile recognize that there is an incongruity between the bilateral relationship and what is happening at the UN. And oftentimes what is happening within multilateral institutions is the price of doing business in their minds for being able to cooperate with Israel and not have their antagonism in their streets. Thank you. Okay, next question, ma'am. Go ahead. Susan Miller, I'm from Kansas City, Missouri. Fourth visit here. Uh, I can understand why you would want the capital to be in Jerusalem, but to build the embassy? Now, isn't Tel Aviv and Jerusalem close enough that you wouldn't have to do that? That's my question. My understanding is that the embassy is going into the building where the consular services are, which is, by the way, when you're at the State Department, that's where you always do your business anyway. And that's not just true of the US. You know, I mean, countless European diplomats travel to Israel and they do foreign ministry meetings in Jerusalem. They don't go to Knesset meetings in Jerusalem. They go to the Supreme Court in Jerusalem. And so, um, so I, yeah, to me, this is just sort of a, um, this is something that's been a matter of U.S. law um, for decades. It's a matter of kind of making concrete something that's already practically been true for a very long time. But yeah, Christian, I, I would add only one thing. You know, a, a embassy is not just a piece of real estate, so we don't measure it by distance. It's a matter of symbolic value, and by having the embassy in the capital of a state, it's a recognition of the sovereignty and independence of this country. So. And, you know, with this international law of uh, uh, recognition of self-determination, Israel is the only country that has determined that Jerusalem, very naturally, is our capital, and it is not recognized by most countries. The only one. All embassies are in capitals all over the world, wherever they designate. So I believe it is not just a matter of why moving the embassy, but why did it take so long? Okay, next question, ma'am, please. Hi, I'm Carol Krutiansky from New York. Get a little bit closer to the microphone. Yeah. Hi, I'm Carol Krutiansky from New York, and it's a question for the ambassador to Israel. Um, you had mentioned uh, that um, the media sort of order, that the Arabs um, were very anti the world, and that Israel's just recently just tried to catch up. I was very surprised. But my question is, what are you guys re doing about it? Okay, well, it, it may be surprising, but I can tell you that from 1993 on, 1993 was a watershed um, in the sense that the, you know, the Oslo Agreement started and it, Israel, I would say very, maybe naively you would say in hindsight, but really with good faith, uh, we stopped making any efforts to defend ourselves in the political warfare. And we thought that the, the Palestinians would pay in kind, but we were of course sorely wrong. And just as they were sitting with us in the negotiation, on the, around the negotiation table, they kept this incitement, they kept these lies, they kept this political war. Later on, also, it turned into a, all the uh, uh, terror and suicide bombing that went throughout the, uh, the process. Uh, the, at the time, uh, in, the, in the ministry, at least, of foreign affairs, they said, well, if you have a good policy, you don't have to uh, explain it. It explains itself. 
Or conversely, the implication is if you have a bad policy, you know, uh, there's nothing you can do. But this is not true. And we know that in the, uh, in the world of perceptions, in the world of positioning and images, and a lot of it, it goes into the commercial world as well. You know, Coca-Cola has a great product. They still advertise because uh, they still have to do all the commercials. And Coca-Cola is not in the position of Israel. They're not being attacked directly by Pepsi or anybody else. And we are. It took us a while to realize it. And how we respond now is basically uh, in social media, uh, in regular media, and uh, also something which is very, very important is legislation. And I know here in the United States, many of the states legislate against incitement, against BDS. And I think this is the way to go. Next question, sir. Hi, Jack Rosenbaum from New York. Uh, the recent uh, abstention in uh, the United Nations uh, by the prior administration was a, a critical issue because our only club at the UN seems to be our veto power. Uh, to what extent uh, can we control what happens at the UN if the executive decides the abstention is appropriate or chooses uh, to legislate? Kristen, you want to just, to, to, just to make sure the question is, um, to what extent can we control um, when the US administration? Yes, said, yes. Oh, yeah, I completely agree with you on, on that vote. That was what I was alluding to earlier in my um, comments about using the veto, that I think the U.S. really shouldn't hesitate. Um, in my mind, um, you know, the Obama administration sort of uh, invited a lot of this activity from day one of the administration, um, both with kind of an, um, you know, unwise early red line on settlements. Um, I think that the attempt to distance um, themselves from Israel invited some, um, you know, invited some of the appeals to Palestinian membership and organizations, and I thought that that decision was um, was really unwise, and we're going to pay for it for a while. So my view is the U.S. needs to be unapologetic about saying we're just not letting this stuff through the Security Council. That's, in, you know, we're a permanent member for a reason, and we're prepared to use the veto. Next question, please. My name is Jay Martis. I live in Washington, D.C. Israel is, and, and the United States, as a strong ally, has been defending itself against overwhelming odds in international community. But most recently, the bleed between Zionism and anti-Semitism is growing in the world. In Poland, with a recent passage of criminalization of mentioning of Poland's association, with the death camps and with the Shoah. Israel has a tremendous bilateral trade and diplomatic relationship with Poland, but we see this trend in Central Europe and nationalism uh, strains throughout Europe. How can you move forward in trying to put forward a positive position with friends who, on the other hand, are making and doing things that are straining relationship for Jews beyond Zionism. Danny, I think it's probably directed at you. Yeah, well, you know, since 1976, when again the Arabs introduced this abominable uh, resolution that Zionism is racism, which took us about 16 years to uh, repeal, again with the help of our best friend and ally, the United States, the uh, Again, our, our enemies are trying to make a distinction, which is a very artificial one, between Zionism and Judaism. And this is a very artificial one because I say that by definition, every Jew is a Zionist. We read in the Haggadah next year in Jerusalem, all the prayers mention Jerusalem. During 2,000 years of exile, it was Jerusalem that kept us as, as, as a people. And uh, this artificial distinction is simply because anti-Semitism is not politically correct anymore. And also, I believe, again, here the Palestinians, in a very sophisticated way, are trying to drive a wedge. And unfortunately, they succeed to some extent to have a division among 
Jewish communities, especially here in the United States, that, uh, that some of the Jewish community say, well, I distinguish between Judaism and Zionism. This is, of course, false, and any manifestation of anti-Zionism is against the state of Israel and against any Jew wherever he is. Yeah, maybe a follow-up with Keith or Kristen. Um, so when issues like this come up, like the Poland issue, uh, obviously, Dana gave a very uh, cogent response of what the Israeli government's responsibility and action might be. But from your experience, um, when, when, the, when domestic issues come up uh, that may be viewed as uh, very biased against Israel or the United States or other allies of ours, what role maybe do we play uh, in the international community from the seats that uh, perhaps you guys occupied in past positions? Did you, did you want this? Uh, yeah, I, let me answer that briefly. Um, uh, I think that the United States traditionally uh, uses very ordinarily quiet diplomacy, but diplomacy that matters significantly to these countries uh, on a bilateral basis, and also within the multilateral within multilateral institutions. I, I do want to say that I think that one of the things that worries me about the present administration is that they've weakened our alliance and partnerships with our key allies in Europe. Uh, I think it was uh, a huge mistake to go to Saudi Arabia, embrace and basically say we're not going to uh, talk to you about your human rights problems, and then go to to, to Europe um, and uh, make the and lecture our closest allies and friends, not reaffirm Article Five of NATO. Uh, because what that does is it diminishes our capability to achieve foreign policy objectives, including this objective, including the defense of Israel uh, on a bilateral basis. So it's just something that worries me, and I'm, I'm hoping over time the administration will have more coherent foreign policy, one that goes back to our traditions of supporting key alliances and partnerships so that we can be more influential and effective on addressing these things. Now, when there's, a, when there's an official matter, matter of government policy um, from one of our European allies, I think the, you know, the U.S. can be very kind of vocal and straightforward in dealing with it. But one of the huge challenges now that this administration is going to face with Europe is the rise of some of these parties, extremist parties who are outside of government or maybe have a minority seat in government who have anti-Semitism deep in their DNA. And for these parties, actually a big vocal U.S. opposition might be what they want. Actually, they use that to kind of play to their crowd. So it's, a, it's going to be an incredible challenge for the U.S. going forward, I think, is how do we watch this kind of rise for multi-party systems um, and some of these kind of extremist groups on both the right and the left um, in Europe. How are we going to kind of navigate this over the, over the next Thank decade? Thank you. Okay, next question, ma'am. Go ahead. Hello, uh, my name is uh, Joyce Baldwin uh, Spencer, and actually my question is related to what everyone is talking about now. It seems that Israel is now 70 years old, and what they've accomplished during that time, I don't think any country in history has accomplished that much, but it seems that even if you do good uh, for your own people and for people around the world, it's not good enough. And I guess what I'm saying is that it just seems that so many tragedies that have happened to the Jewish people have been very simple. It's just been because people, uh, so many um, people around the world, not everyone, but so many, have a very negative um, feelings about Judaism and about the Jewish people. So I was just wondering if uh, you see that the world is, will be different now and there's a different way to um, address the issues of anti-Semitism. Danny. Uh, if I may, just one correction. Israel is basically not 70 years old, it's 4,000 years old as a, pe as a uh, people and 3,000 years old as a nation since King David established sovereignty over Jerusalem and Judea, Samaria, and all that. Um, I would say that uh, anti-Semitism is manifested itself through, through many, many forms. And uh, sometimes you have to be very, very sensitive to make sure that it doesn't kind of uh, slip its way into a curriculum 
or into media, certainly social media, where it's very, uh, you can see some very blatant anti-Semitic uh, uh, slurs over there. I here also believe that we should not let any lie hang in the air without an answer. I think this is a, uh, a lesson that we have learned, and I think this is our responsibility for our future. Also, I think that, uh, as I mentioned before, in, in the state level here in the United States, certainly in Congress, I believe in each and every country in the world, certainly the European countries, and the Israeli government is pushing that for a legislation of anti that, uh, that bans anti-Semitism. I think this is the way not just uh, uh, to legislate, but also to enforce it. And for this, I can tell you that uh, every ambassador of, of Israel anywhere around the world uh, is instructed to be very, very attentive and sensitive to any manifestation of uh, anti-Semitism to make sure that there would be a legislation against it, and if there is a legislation, to make sure it is enforced. Okay. Um, if I can just remind everybody, uh, just to try to get a few more questions in, please keep your questions short, uh, and also please try not to make a statement. Please, sir. I think this will, uh, my name is Mo Feldman from uh, Philadelphia. Um, I'll, this will be short. I think my answer has probably been already addressed, but uh, the, the difference between anti-Semitism and, uh, and uh, anti-Israel or anti-Zionist, it seems to me that BDS is just a vi veiled excuse for anti-Semitism. The anti-Semitism in this country has increased by threefold uh, over this last year. I don't know whether there's any more to answer on that or not. Um, okay. I think we're going to move on to the next question. Yes, sir. Um, hello. My name is Brendan Green, and I attend the University of South Florida. Um, my question is, how do the United States and Israel approach and address efforts and attempts by international bodies to impose resolutions to the conflict, such as the Goldstone Report? Kristen, you want to uh, take the first sure. shot? Sure. So um, there are a lot of ways we attack that problem. One of them is the personnel issue. Um, one of the kind of persistent challenges um, with the U.S. is the selection of people who have an obvious bias, a long history of um, anti-Israel venom, um, getting these seats, and I think the U.S. has to be really vocal in opposing that, and also in advancing, you know, there's no reason we shouldn't have Americans um, in some of these slots, and so being kind of proactive on that. Um, I think there's a real challenge, a question for Israel on all these issues, which Danny might want to tackle, which is to what extent they want to cooperate when there's uh, kind of a special rapporteur and investigation, um, to what extent do they want to make Israeli officials available? And I think that's a really tough call. If you know that the final product isn't going to be fair or legitimate, um, do you want to do that or do you want to be, you know, to see, you know, seem to be sort of cooperative and open? Um, Danny, anything? Yeah, well, we, we have always learned that even with the best intentions that we have or the U.S. and we try to introduce some uh, resolution about whether it's about uh, climate change or desertification or healthcare or, or whatever, certainly on political issues, it is always turned against us because, you know, there are many, many drafts. And with the drafts, unfortunately, uh, the Arabs just put their clauses that just we cannot live with. And uh, so we have learned not to be too... Um, um, I mean, to, to be uh, as initiator of many uh, resolutions, because we cannot, and we concentrate our work at the UN with cooperation on the ground. That is, Israeli experts, uh, whether it's on uh, counterterrorism, 